We've reached uh, 10.30, so I'd like to formally welcome everybody to our webinar and, uh, and to our online conference. We're kicking off the conference with 12 great ways to improve contact center performance. And uh, we've got some uh, great uh, slides uh, for you today. I'm delighted to uh, uh, welcome back a, a regular uh, contributor to our uh, webinar program, Peter Massey from Bud. Uh, welcome, Peter. Good morning, John T. Hi, Patrice. And um, uh, you're joining us today. Uh, we're very uh, grateful to get you. I think you've got a, a, a road trip that you're, you're on, and, and today is your rest day. So I'm, we're very grateful to get you in, uh, in for our webinar. Where are, you, where are you going from and to? I'm going from Kent down to Rome. And actually, I've been following the old Pilgrim's Way as much as possible, which is the shortest route. Um, and uh, fascinating run it is. So sort of this is day five, a rest day, and I'm down in Tuscany now, so nearly there. Wonderful. And you're taking a, a, an old classic car. Yep, 1937. She's 82 years old and uh, a great conversation piece. The, the, it's, it's great to be smiling at people, though. Sometimes you wish that the uh, people in the outside lane on the motorway wouldn't slow down to take pictures because the cars coming up behind them can be fairly scary. <laughs> I can I can imagine that. Also delighted to uh, welcome uh, Patrice Orenas uh, Lerma from uh, Diablicom. Uh, welcome, Patrice. Uh, hi, John T. Hi, Peter. And for people not uh, familiar with the uh, Diablicom, do you want to give a sort of short potted uh, history? Because I think you're you're sort of fairly new into the UK market. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were founded in France in 2005 as a telecom operator and a contact center solution or customer interaction management platform, as we define us uh, at the moment. Uh, we've opened our uh, offices in the UK in 2017, I think. And uh, we've started uh, growing uh, uh, in the UK and getting more and more customers. And I'm very delighted to be uh, here with you and the call center helper too. Uh, I hope help people. And, and uh, excellent. And we, I think we first came across uh, Diablocom on our case study we did on Photobox, uh, yeah. where it's the uh, telephony platform installed there. So welcome, uh, welcome, Patrice. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you want to watch a replay today, uh, that will be available uh, later on, uh, callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinars. Um, uh, also, if you'd like to go into our chat room, we're carrying on the discussion. Uh, here's the address here, callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. And it's your chance to ask questions and tips. Uh, there are a couple of advantages for being in the chat room. The first is that you can download the webinar slides. You can download the slides on this link uh, here. And uh, you can also get uh, hold of a transcript of the uh, uh, of the of the chat as well and uh, in addition you can ask questions or you can uh, put any tips on how to improve performance and uh, we have a rather nice um, prize uh, uh, one of the prizes here is a bottle of a uh, very nice bottle of Tatangi, uh champagne but if you prefer a box of chocolates or an Amazon gift card uh, we can uh, we can do that as well so it's uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the chat room, here's the link, callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. So I'm going to kick off with a poll, and I'd just like to understand what is your most uh, important measure of performance. We've got five here. If there's anything that's not on the list, if you'd just like to uh, put those into the uh, into the chat room. So is your most important measure of performance, is it efficiency and however you want to do it. Is it quality scores? Is it customer satisfaction scores? Is it something like sales volume, uh, the you know, amount of sales you make? Is it something like the net promoter score? What is your big measure of performance? So Peter, do you think there's gonna be one here that, uh, that comes out? Well, it depends who's judging, really, doesn't it? So people who work on the front line, it'll be about customer satisfaction and, and the quality of what they do. Uh, perhaps if you're the sales director, uh, sales volume will be higher than some others. But um, I, I think the, the issue is that we should be watching all of these and working out how they combine rather than making any one more important than the other. 
Indeed. Well, let's have a look at the uh, results. And indeed, customer satisfaction comes up uh, comes up very high overall at uh, 54%, uh, followed by 20% on efficiency. Um, would be very interested if you have put efficiency, uh, if you could put down how you how you calculate efficiency or what metric you're using for efficiency, followed by quality score, 14%, uh, 9% net promoter score, and only 4% on on sales volume so um in a way i'm a little bit surprised that uh, that sales volume doesn't uh, doesn't come doesn't come higher on that list um uh, uh there's a couple of other comments in uh, michelle has said quality score uh, unfortunately in our industry government funding it's not always possible to keep customers satisfied so uh, a quality score is important and um uh a number of people in the chat room saying customer satisfaction is very key. So that looks like a, uh, a fairly clear message. Probably a good uh, chance now to hand across to uh, Peter. And uh, Peter, I think you're going to uh, share share with us some of your thoughts about the un uncontact center. So uh, if you'd like to explain the concept and how that could improve performance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'm quite often asked to talk about the future of contact centers, and uh, as much as it's interesting to uh, pontificate about it, well, one of the things which is uh, most um, perhaps challenging is to think that contact centers won't exist in the future. Um, and people say, what? How does that work? And sort of thing. And, and that's where I come up with this sort of title of the uncontact center, that actually what people need to think about is how much of their time do they spend fire detecting rather than fire fighting? And by that, I mean actually a lot of our call centers are designed to be operated well and to operate better and to be more efficient or higher quality. Whereas actually the, the battle for customers is they didn't want to call the contact center or chat to or email in the first place. So actually the, the fire detection in this analogy is what work do we do in contact centers to collaborate with our partners around the business, the other departments who may cause the contacts that are required. So where's my stuff, for example, something that retailers will recognize as a reason for contact is often due to a misunderstanding on the website about the delivery time. It could be a logistical problem. Uh, it could be a stock problem. These are not problems that the contact center can fix. So I think it's really, really important to sort of use the word uncontact in this sense to challenge what's going on. And you'll see where this comes from really in, in the sense of a, a book which two of my colleagues um, from the States and Australia wrote back in 2008, the best service is no service. And that's the, that's the, the question mark that says, mm, okay, what, what does really good service look like? And actually, as far as customers are concerned, it's not having to deal with any service because whatever it was worked really well first time or didn't break down or whatever it might be. And so it, be, it behoves us to work harder with our colleagues on the way in which these things occur. Um, I often describe this as, um, a, as a passion. How do we stop doing dumb things to our customers and our people? Because a lot of the things that cause contact are, um, are stupid things which shouldn't occur. This is a great insurance example of um, 12 copies of a zero bill coming through the post at one time. Um, and people become inured to these, they become uh, used to them, um, and they, they don't recognize they're there. When I called this insurance company to ask them what it was about, they said, oh, that happens all the time. And we mustn't, in contact centers, become numb to the feeling of the customer has when these regular problems occur. So. So that's the sort of background to it. We work over, all over the, uh, the world with uh, our Linebridge Alliance, but um, lots and lots of different companies in the UK that we, we work with. So I'm just gonna give sort of eight tips, which uh, obviously I won't go into practical detail in too much, but I want to give sort of eight focus areas here where I think it's really important for contact centers to be thinking about. And they all use the un word uh, or the uh, prefix un. Uh, beforehand. So are you going to use unspoken to represent what happens for most customers um, when it comes to feedback? So most customers don't give feedback. And that's often because feedback is harder work than the process itself. 
So whatever it is you are doing, you're faced with either online or on bits of paper or hurdles to jump through to actually give your feedback. And what I often do is say to the person, this is a classic example at Gatwick Airport, um, I'll say to people, can I just give you the feedback? And they say, uh, no, computer doesn't accept that. So actually, most people think, mm, is it worth the effort of giving the feedback? And that's a, that's a question you should challenge yourself to. What, what do you say to them? What do you communicate on the back of all the feedback you gather? And when they do have a, a complaint, again, in regulated businesses, a complaint can be anywhere between feedback and a, a full-on problem. Um, but when there is a complaint, how do you stop them feeling that it's so painful that they don't want to bother with the complaint? Um, the mousetrap here illustrates what I think it feels like to a lot of customers when you put your hand into the uh, complaint department. So that's unspoken. Uh, the second point is unheard. Um, and this relates to a similar point, really, but internally to our frontline staff who work in stores or work in contact centers, um, that actually what we see time and time again is um, that, that people don't feel that what they know is being listened to by management. Now, you know, as consultants going in and fixing things, we, the first thing we do is go down to the contact center, listen to calls, talk to staff. They nearly always know what happens, they know why it happens, they know over years sometimes the patterns that have occurred about why these things are happening. And yet it's terribly difficult to find organizations who really sincerely respect what their frontline staff know. That comes back to personal leadership of spending the time listening to frontline staff and then getting systematic about how you collect it and use it. It's no good just listening and saying, I hear you, that's a brilliant first step, but you then have to go on and say, okay, how do we gather this? How do we put it systematically into what we do? Because we gather feedback all over the business, but unless we are seen to be listening to people, um, that feedback doesn't have the same impact in terms of motivation in a contact center. Okay, the third point um, is uncommon sense. Uh, so in English, we say, um, you know, common sense. Why can't um, businesses act with common sense? Um, and it seems so uncommon sometimes that businesses can do that. So to give an example, um, I recently swapped over my um, internet provider and the new internet provider was having problems with some sort of security setting in the network, which is causing problems. Now, as much as I diagnosed it, and I know where the problem occurs, I know where the latency problem is, and I can explain that to the agent on the call, the particular agent, Emma at uh, BT, was, um, had a process to go through, shall we say, and she could not take me to the next level of the process until she tested my line when I was at home. And it was interesting to, to coach her through, but what if we'd done that, what would you do next? And where would we go after that? And give her a due, she actually did do that. And she broke out the process and she got somewhere. But so often what we find is that the processes of a business are uncommonly difficult to deal with. And what's important about that is in a world where AI and analytics are coming in quite rapidly, if we cannot define the processes and the business rules by which we step from one step to another, then how are we gonna program chatbots? How are we gonna program mm -hmm. knowledge bases? How are we gonna program automation when we can't do that in a contact center? The, the algorithms, um, and this word algorithm is very fancy, but all it means is the logic. If this, then that. Um, we have to be able to understand that in the current operation in order to be able to use the automation that's now available to us. So still very uncommon sense to find organizations who can break this down. Pretty much everybody is trying to. So the next one, uh, I call it unhuman. Of course, that's not a correct term. It should be inhuman. But um, the, the robotics now and the analytics that are available to us, the, re, uh, the robotic process automation um, that's available in the back office to do simple tasks that people can do is already having quite a major impact on uh, particularly organizations which are not just a simple resolution at the front end on a call or a contact, but, but are 
dependent on different parts of the organization behind them. So I think what we've got to be really cognizant of is we have to get the business uncommon sense right in order to be able to use the inhuman uh, technologies that are going to be available to us. And if we can't do that, then our robots and our processing is going to feel unhuman, and that's not great for customers at all. So it's really important. The point here is not that we'll get the answers right straight away, but the one's got to read up, to understand, and to test and learn. Even if you start in very small ways, start looking at the different technologies that are available um, to be able to do this. And we're seeing certainly, for example, with speech analytics and text analytics, a lot of our large clients have these tools, but the test and learn mentality is still growing. And it takes years to develop that to the point at which you can get these technologies to work really, really well for customers in that way. So um, unseen and unconnected. So in fact, this, this is just a, a, a photo showing a, a piece of our network. So Joseph, my French colleague, Bill, my American colleague, that's the three of us in a bar in Portugal. Um, and what, what's the connection here? I think the point is that one needs to reach out to colleagues around the world or around the office, and one has to have good communication, good collaboration with those colleagues, because the people in marketing, the people in sales, the people in logistics, people in product development and so forth, they are the ones who quite often are developing things for the customer, which don't necessarily deliver what the customer wants and cause the contacts that we handle in the call center. I'm a great believer in, um, in actually going out and partying with your colleagues, get to know them and build the collaboration that you need in order to uh, make the contact center really um, optimize for customers rather than just get better at handling calls. And what's the old phone for? Well, I think it's timely to remember what it was like before there were call centers. I've been around long enough that I saw this migration towards call centers. And of course, what was happening before was phones, phones and phone numbers were spread all over the business and calls were not handled well, contacts were not handled well. And if we're not careful, you can see this proliferation around the organization again. The technologies allow us to do it and do it really, really well so that we can have home workers, we can have people um, spread around the business as technical experts, and we can handle all that with the technology, but we have to get their buy-in to do it, we have to get their collaboration to do it. So networking inside the organization, I think is really important. Okay, so last couple of points. Um, I've put this one up about unstaffed. I mentioned it just in the introduction about stress and, and workplaces. Some con contact centers you go into are extremely good places to work, but there is a common factor and that is it's unrelenting. And stress to me can be built in or built out of contact centers, depending on the budgets that we have and the way that we fight for our budgets and justify them um, so that the level of service is good for customers and it's good for staff. So staff have got time to breathe, to develop, to read, and to actually um, be on top of their game. And if you can get the commitment to those budgets and resource accordingly, you can really make a difference to both the service and the, the pleasure that people have in, in working those in contact centers. Whoops, I've just gone past one there by mistake. Here we go. And, and part of that, feeling then that you're trying to generate is that people are happy at work, that they don't feel managed to, um, to this cartoons uh, view here. Our team leaders need to be coaches, not bosses. And that feeling of space to be able to do the job properly is what people talk about when, they, and when they've worked in contact centers, which are, are run really well and resourced really well. And the last point, I think we should be unashamed about contact centers. Sometimes the contact center industry can be a bit shy or you know, when you're in a bar and you're having a drink, people say, what do you do? There's nothing wrong with contact centers. The work that gets done in them is brilliant. Customers love it when it's done well. Um, do we party enough? I think sometimes we can be so close to what we're doing that the great work that's going on needs to be um, celebrated, identified, catch people doing, <clears throat> doing things well, and work really hard to create that positivity that can come from great contact centers. So that's my point of view, about eight points perhaps to be focused on. 
Um, particularly this point about fire detection rather than firefighting, get the balance right of that, look outwards into your organization rather than only just getting better at handling calls. That's the point. So I hope you've enjoyed that. And John T, with that, back to you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there's some uh, great points uh, there, Peter, some ones I particularly like. Uh, is it worth customers' effort giving uh, feedback? Do we make it so difficult to uh, to do that? How do we overcome overcome that? How do we make our automation not feel inhuman? I certainly like the test and learn uh, process you were following. Um, certainly one thing that's, I think, absolutely critical, build collaboration with colleagues from other, de other departments, uh, because it's too easy to get uh, uh, caught up in uh, in sort of rivalry between uh, different departments. Uh, so networking is, is quite key on that. And we should be unashamed about contact centers, uh, celebrate success and uh, create positivity. I think that's a, a very, very, uh, very, very key thing to do. So um, I'd like to now follow up on a poll and it was very much tied in, Peter, to your point about um, firefighting or uh, fire fixing. And um, you know, are you actually are you actually fixing the problem? So I'd just like to um, put up a poll that says, on a scale of one to five, does your organisation uh, focus on handling contacts better, or does it focus on removing contacts? So five is handling uh, handling contacts better. Uh, one is removing contacts. And it's a scale uh, between one and five. So which end of that scale would you say you are on? So uh, four is, is probably perhaps a bigger focus on handling contacts better. Three is probably a, an equal split. Uh, two is more focus on removing contacts. And uh, one is mostly removing contacts. So where do you fit on that uh, scale overall? So I think we've got most people voted there. I'm just going to share the... Uh, results with everyone and um, sample size here of 99 and um, looks like generally speaking there's quite a skew there towards handling contacts better rather than removing contacts and I, Peter I, I, I don't know if this ties in with with what you've what you've observed do you yes very much I, so yeah I think I think what you notice is that it, digital businesses are born not wanting contact centers. And so startups and businesses, which can be very large scale now, like Nest or um, uh, businesses like that, they don't start with a contact center in mind. They start with avoiding the contact center completely and then put the contact center on to reassure customers and to do things really well. So uh, a great example is I took a, a very large insurance company to see um, AO.com. Um, who supply white goods. Um, in AO.com at that time, there was something like uh, an equal number of analysts to contact center handlers. Um, whereas in the insurance company, there was something like 6,000 agents and 20 analysts. And, and the really good test of where you are on this curve is a, you know, the amount of time people are spending analyzing what to do better and stopping it happening versus actually handling the calls. Indeed, and uh, certainly uh, the AO.com uh, is uh, uh, certainly a good one to visit up in uh, up in Bolton. Uh, we had a very good uh, site visit to them. So let's have a look at uh, what some of the tips and questions are coming uh, coming through. Uh, Patrice, here's a, a question for you: Who plays the greater role for customer satisfaction? Is it the company, or is it the employee? Well, I think the the employee uh, plays the greater role, but his his capability of playing that great role is driven by the company's will and the, what the company is bringing to the employee, the tools, the culture, um, the the resources. Uh, so I think it's a teamwork between the team and the employee. But what's clear is that an employee that's not happy in the company is not going to do a great role in customer satisfaction. So Peter, would you say this is a sort of chicken and egg? Uh, question yeah sort of I mean it's quite interesting when you're a customer marking a score if you're giving a feedback score on an agent it's the number of times the agent can do everything they can do really really well but it doesn't help you the customer 
and that tells you the difference between which part of the process is down to the company, which part of the process is down to the, the, the employee on the end of the phone. So I, I think you can't separate and I, I would always look at the answer to the question being both and then say, is it not both? Rather than starting from the point of view that it's either or. Indeed. Well, we had a, a couple of um, points earlier about uh, efficiency being the, one of the key measures in the uh, contact centre. Mar Marcel has said uh, efficiency is our most important metric. We're an inbound call centre. We handle, we calculate efficiency by the ability of each individual to offer solution from only one contact. Uh, so their measure of um, efficiency is first time uh, resolution. And Lucy said we're an inbound uh, control centre. We calculate efficiency by AHD and call quality. We have a dedicated role in our business where someone evaluates all calls to ensure consistency, uh, not used enough to manage our staff, in my opinion. We've had a, a tip in from Nicola who says, to address the unheard, we're creating a continuous improvement team to capture all anecdotal feedback from customers and staff alike, taking everything forward to be reviewed holistically, prioritised and specific actions taken away. Uh, we're all able to see how feedback can and does make a difference, and able to share this with our customers too. Um, Peter, it looks like this, Nicholas, follow what you were saying about making the, uh, making the listening to the frontline staff and also customers uh, systematic. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's interesting. We did a survey back in 2007, would you believe, where we just looked at where people were on this scale. And actually, uh, that data hasn't changed, what, 12 years later. So lots of organizations trying to do this. Uh, and it's, it's terribly difficult to get it to uh, last consistently in the way that Amazon does. Amazon has worked on that process and delivered that process for 25 years. And only by not going away and finding the next shiny thing to do, but sticking to this process forever and ever, do you actually reduce the number of contacts down and down and down for each of the reasons that customers get in touch. So terribly important process. And of course, changing a lot now because of speech analytics. Um, we can analyze the reasons for demand and we can analyze what to do about it using a lot of analytics, but still important to duplicate that with what people say because it's much quicker to find things in the analytics if you understand what's happening. So a combination of agents and analytics is much more powerful than analytics on its own or indeed on pe with people on their own. Indeed, we're well, on a similar vein, and Patrice, you may have a, a feeling on this one. Uh, Lucy said, side-by-side -side coaching is the norm. We're trying to get a place where operators feel comfortable having conversations and feedback sessions at their desk, as well as in confidential one-to-one -one sessions, so that more time can be spent with them. This is useful if you're challenged with taking, uh, taking agents off the, off the phone. What's your thought on that? Oh, um, that's, I mean, we're not operating contact centers, but uh, the, the agent is key in uh, the process we're, when we're building our product. So we have a UX designer that we send at our customers to do shadowing. It's a bit like side-by-side -side coaching. The UX designer is looking at how the agent is processing the calls uh, in a call center and will adapt um, continuously the interface to make it um, the best for the agent for to, to do its work. So yeah, definitely side-by-side -side coaching or shadowing is I think a great way to have um, agents in situation and improve uh, their job, their efficiency, but also the feeling that they are useful and, uh, and listened to. Indeed. And um, we've got a, a tip in from uh, Helen who says, um, uh, we're looking at creating a Dragon's Den type of forum for our people to get engagement in new commercial customer satisfaction or retention projects, which can help not only to drive business forward, but help in individuals for their personal development plans and understanding of other areas of the business. I guess the, the challenge here, Peter, would be that Dragon's Den tends to in, infer that some things get listened to and some things, some things don't. Yeah, it, it, it is a difficulty in that um, actually being heard systematically means being able to go back and say, okay, we've heard these ideas. And, and as often as, my, as, as not, saying we're not going to do these things for mm -hmm. these reasons is just as powerful as saying we are going to do these things for these reasons. So 
when you when you start to draw up all the different mechanisms you can use to involve staff there are you know a whole myriad of them and um, one's got to pick what works in in your culture um but particularly i'm, I'm sure agents in this contact center would be very happy to get off the phones for you know 15 or 30 minutes and take part in those dragon dens it, it's part of being part of the contribution if you like you can make yeah. rather than just only being treated as a frontline member of staff and certainly one of the, the techniques i heard about was um actually just pick three problems the three biggest problems in the contact center and just focus on fixing those three and as soon as you've got one of those yeah. fixed you add something onto that list of list of three and if you can yeah. communicate Almost. that that's a very powerful way of feeding back to your staff that uh, you're taking things yeah. on board yeah, or more formally, people use quad systems in, and they're agile now as well. And it's exactly the same thing. It's just got a little bit more technique and a little bit more rigor to the way that it's done. Let's have a look at a couple of others. Jessica says we hold monthly sessions where we ask our operators what is and isn't going well in their opinion. This is entirely an alliance and management meet to discuss these points and create action points. This shows that our operators, uh, this shows to our operators that they're being heard and things will be done uh, where possible to improve them. I think that's a, a great way of making things uh, uh, systematic. Lucy says, to address unheard, we have a people forum. Uh, no managers attend these sessions to give the staff the freedom uh, to say what they need to say. This is chaired and fed back to management team to take action on. Um, Peter, again, I think that's that's an interesting one of keeping keeping management out of it at the first stage. Is there a yeah, danger that... It, well, it depends entirely on who the managers are, what kind of leaders they are, because some leaders will only learn by feeling the pain. You know, they need to be there and poked in the eye. And other mm -hmm. managers are very good listeners and, you know, would, ex would respond very well to the fact that people have taken responsibility and then given some priorities. So I, I don't think you can say one rule uh, applies to everybody. You've got to be very specific about the the culture of the organization and the, and the style of leadership that works and i guess it's about creating a safe to say uh, a safe to say environment uh, barry says as a leader the easiest thing you can do to improve performance is to be approachable uh mix with the team and maybe even go out with them if you're invited just do something get to know your team and make sure they know that you are human and approachable um patrice uh one of the uh, techniques I often ask when I visit a, a contact center, I ask the, the um, team leaders, uh, particularly on a, on towards the end of a Monday or a Tuesday, what their team did at the weekend. And I find that actually a very telling uh, example that some team leaders know their team and others uh, obviously don't. Yeah, that's interesting. I, mean, I think it's not only um, about the person who's the leader, who the leader is, uh, it's, it's sometimes about the company. Uh, if we go back to the question earlier, is it the company or the employee? I think some companies are have that spirit and that mentality of um, we are all at the same level, at least when it's about uh, discussing together. Some company in some companies, you still have that leader leader versus agent uh, positioning. Uh, that I think is a pity, but um, it's more the, the company than the person, I think. Indeed. Well, now is probably quite a good time to uh, uh, jump across to uh, Patrice. And I think, Patrice, you're going to be showing a, a few ways that technology can help uh, yeah. improve performance. Yeah. So if you'd like to uh, put your slides up on the uh, up on the screen and we can take uh, take us through your ideas. Here we go. We can see that. Uh, uh, yeah, great. So, yeah, as I said, I'm um, I'm marketing director at, at Diabolocom, uh, which is a um, uh, contact center solution provider and telecom operator, uh, which has customers in uh, in more than 20 countries. Uh, we operate also in the UK, and I'm going to go on with the with the, um, the the ways you can improve your contact center. So, um, Peter, you ended up with the um, eight way, I think, way number eight. Uh, number nine, uh, I suggest you focus on customer experience and not technology. Um, a recent study, I think it was a 2017 study, said that 39% of UK contact centers have uh, already moved to the cloud and 53% are planning to do so within the 
upcoming three years. And there's a good reason for that, is that it's, it, it's, it means moving from that to that type of interface to manage uh, your inbound calls, for example. That's very important because it makes business people able to adjust to contact center in real time. Sometimes you want to change um, skills of your teams or you want to adjust um, a question in your IVR uh, and you need your IT team to do it and, and it takes one, one week, two weeks and it's a pain. I think Cloud Contact Center makes the um, customer service department able to uh, focus on uh, their customers and the customer experience. Um, Another uh, idea that might be interesting is in order to provide personalization, which is key, I think, in, in the way we shoot and all customers, you need CRM integration. Um, at Diabolicom, we've been working with the, the Photobox group, as you, as you said, John T, uh, for a few years now. Um, they have 30 million customers over the world in 12 different countries. And um, if you're preparing your holiday photo album with them, um, and you call our contact center, the agent on the line can see your customer profile even before they start speaking with you uh, from the first second. That's, that makes a difference. Knowing that 70% of their calls happen before the customer has clicked on the order button on their website, it's, it's, it makes a major difference in the business and it makes a major difference for the customer. Uh, it's very important also because it makes the agent able to have a single screen view. Uh, I think we're moving from contact centers with multiple screens for the agents to a single screen view, which makes the agent able to see the appropriate information at the right time and not lose a lot of time digging between screens. ID number 11, um, a good way to improve efficiency is knowing the activity of your contact center. Uh, we're also working with the world leader of mortars, uh, Weber, and uh, they had five contact centers in their factories um, without any data or analytics to know how they were working. Basically, every single of their customer had their uh, allocated agent. So you can easily imagine that there's no over, there was no overflow. Uh, whenever someone was missing, the customer were not served. Um, the data made them able to analyze the flows of calls they were having, identify the skills that were required for agents, and now they've improved the routing by being able to manage overflow and, and also to decide to route some calls to new agents so that they get trained and discover new sides of the business, which also makes them happier. And uh, last but not least, um, you were talking, Peter, about um, the uncontact contact center. Um, I think what is important uh, is proactivity in the contact center in order to avoid the contact that comes from the customer. Uh, at least more, at least 10% of the inbound calls could be avoided when at the same time we see that only 15% of the outbound calls are proactive calls. Actually, most of them are callbacks of people that could not be called if that's implemented at the contact center. Um, what is interesting when you start being proactive and doing outbound calls in your contact center is that you can benefit from call blending and make sure that your agents are 100% efficient because when they don't get inbound calls, they can run outbound campaigns and get in touch with customers that might need, that, that will not need to, um, to get in touch with your contact center then. And why is it also important? Um, we were talking about customer satisfaction as a, as a main KPI. Um, Net Promoter Score is clearly, according to the poll we, we've just run, uh, the, the key one uh, at the moment. Uh, in 2010, our business review introduced the customer effort score, and we see that now it's the number one KPI for customer loyalty, meaning that you reduce your customer efforts, the customer feels that he doesn't have to make any effort to deal with your brand, you gain customer loyalty. And we're working with a lot of, of um, new economy and, and digital brands, but we're also working with uh, heavy industries like Weber I've just talked about. 
and they are all switching to that view that it's good to have a customer, but it's more and more difficult to keep the customer. And, and that's also why contact centers are getting more and more important in any industry because they are key to keep the customers and reduce the customer at full score. Um, I only have had four tips and, and ideas for you today. Um, if you have any other question and want to know more about what we can do for you, you can contact us for, for a demo. And I think, John, you're going you're gonna to share all the information later. Indeed. In fact, a uh, good time now. If you'd like to get a demonstration of the uh, system from uh, Patrice, uh, then just put your details into the uh, box here. Uh, while doing that, um, some great, uh, great points there. Um, focus on the customer experience and not on the uh, technology. Uh, analyze call flows and then uh, use this to improve your routing and uh, start being proactive uh, using things like callbacks to be able to call customers back. And I think quite important, both um, Peter and um, Patrice saying that contact centers are certainly gaining importance within the organization. It's getting uh, harder to um, uh, keep customers and the contact center is a key part of uh, key part of that. So some uh, great feedback on that overall. So um, we're going to jump back to the uh, chat room and have a look at uh, what's been going on uh, with the audience. And uh, we've had a tip in from uh, Michelle says, um, we have a home working environment and it's all about using all the options available. We introduced Zoom recently to help build rapport for meetings and to make it completely optional for employees where they prefer to use video chat or telephone so you can provide opportunities to connect. We also have a pre-hire call so that before new hires join on day one, the team leader calls and introduces themselves and tells the employee about the team they'll be joining. We found this really helps with them um, uh, within onboarding. So um, Peter, I think this is quite a nice um, quite a nice tip to, to, to bring people on board of uh, actually setting up a call before someone joins. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in fact, a lot of businesses I know get the team leader involved in recruiting their own team. Um, that's not possible in the larger scale operations, but in, in even quite large ones that say three, 400 agents, it's possible to recruit to the team um, and build that personal relationship even a step, step earlier. But certainly it's important. And, and recognizing what uh, Michelle is saying there in the home working environment, the nature of the team leader relative to the staff from home is even more important because they need that rapport which is handled remotely. Certainly what, what I saw in the early days of home working is quite a lot of um, people recruiting from the locality because people could come in for training, for top up um, information, et cetera. And some people doing you know, one day of work in the, in the call center and four days of work at home or these kind of combinations. Today, the technology is way better, and you know, agents are working from much larger, a lot across larger geographies. So something like Zoom or just any of the simple chat tools is is so vital to staying in touch mm -hmm. with the organisation. Um, and certainly, the level of knowledge retention and knowledge maintenance is absolutely crucial in that sense. And, and Patrice, I went on a fact-finding trip to the uh, United States in November. And one of the things I found that was was very different from Europe was the amount of homeworking. There's a, a lot more homeworking in in the United States than there is currently in in uh, in Europe. Are you seeing this as a trend that's growing in your yeah, dealings with customers? It's definitely, and I think that the one of the reasons is that I mean, as a joke, some of our customers say, "Well, your product is amazing, but uh, can't you just?" implement a feature so you can, we can manage our HR because it's so hard to recruit good agents in, in the contact centers. And I think home working is one of the ways in the US they found to, to, to do that. Um, if, if you've got, I mean, with the cloud technologies, and that's what I was saying, you can work from everywhere. And we've already got agents everywhere. And I think it's a key to recruit and to keep people in the, in the company to uh, have home working. Mm, indeed, and it was quite interesting that uh, the profile of the home worker was often very different from people based in the office. A lot of the home workers never ever thought they'd be working in a, a contact center, but perhaps had a, a 
you know, a career break to bring up a family or a carer and then came into it almost by accident. But they had the skills that were needed for this new um, advanced role of, of, if you like, super agent uh, that is that is needed. Let's have a look what else we've got coming through. Sorry, Peter. No, it's just going to add a further comment. We, we were with a client last week who is now paying their customers to handle the calls. Uh, there oh, are well. platforms available that enable you to do that. So that it's developing quite a long way. Indeed, I can imagine. The, um, Marcel says, we have a post-induction training period. We created a position of team leader to handle the new trainees in their first six weeks after the induction training. This will help them to integrate better and get them up to speed faster than normal. We wanted to have a team leader dedicated for the new employees in the early stage of the uh, organization. I certainly think that's a nice way of, uh, of bringing people on, on board. Um, Ahmed says that uh, use speech analytics to uncover unheard issues. Patrice, I think that was a, a point that you made. Yeah, it's um, it's it's an interesting topic. Uh, as you know, we're working in a lot of countries, so with a lot of languages, uh, and we we think it's 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 very important speech analytics. Um, so we've decided to build a product that can plug with any solution, because uh, and I think Peter, you will agree, there's there's no current solution that you, we could say is the best one in the market for speech analytics. Yeah, it depends a, a lot on what function you want the speech analytics to do. And, and there's a lot of myths about what it can do and can't do. So, for example, in, in this context of finding out new unheard issues, actually agents are really quick at spotting the unheard issues. And if the agents work with the analysts, then they can use the speech analytics to really delve into that issue. Um, if you just set the machine running and say, OK, tell me when anything new happens, you know, speech analytics is still not very good at that unstructured learning. Um, that's the next generation, if you like, and it's it's uh, still a little way off. So uh, Lucy's uh, asked a question, which is saying, uh, what is uh, most important in your business? Is it average handling time or is it cool quality? What do you drive your teams on most of all? So it'd be interesting if uh, people in the audience would say uh, what their view is uh, on those two metrics, average handling time or call, call quality. Um, Peter, AHT seems to have been a bit more discredited as a as a metric, particularly as an agent and as an agent target these days. Yes, I think the last time I saw data on that it was something like 50% of UK businesses have, have dropped AHT as an agent measure. AHT is really important from a resource planning point of view. Um, and understanding the, the spread in that average um, is, is just as important as knowing the average. Um, but, but when it comes to what's the right length of call to handle an individual customer's problem, you know, you don't really want agents being driven by the clock. So um, I, I think the, definitely that trend is, is already large and growing in terms of, uh, of where we've got to uh, in the market. It, it's still, it's not the same in other, other countries. So in the States, for example, when I have this discussion with my American colleagues, the AHT on the agent is still, uh, I think, very common. Yeah, indeed, I saw that on my uh, on my fact finding trip. Uh, Patrice, do you have a view on this question? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think AHT is a metric. It's important to organize your teams to know uh, how long you need to handle a, a call. Um, but definitely, what I see in our customers is that the most of them implement a post call survey to measure what is really a KPI, a performance indicator, which is the call quality. Okay, so let's take a couple more uh, couple of more audience tips. Uh, if you've not sent in your tip, there's a, a bottle of champagne that is um, uh, up for grabs for the winning tip, so uh, send, those, uh, send those through. Uh, Barry says proactive messaging can be a great way to in reduce inbound contact volumes, but just remember to align the messaging of your contact center with other departments like marketing accounts or research. Certainly I've seen things like, uh, I had one recently where the water company sent me a text message saying your water will be disconnected uh, and it might go you know, brown in, uh, brown in color. And so I didn't need to contact them to say there was a, a problem with that. Patrice, that's, um, I think was one of, the, one of the points you were making about proactive contact. 
Yeah, I mean, proactive contact, it doesn't mean just uh, loading a CSV file in a, and calling people without thinking. Um, what, we, what our customers do is that they have a deep integration between their um, CRM and marketing systems, identifying who to call, and automatically pushing uh, outbound campaigns uh, in, in uh, Diabolocom to do the proactive messaging with the right message. It's, it's, it's technology that makes it possible uh, in a smart way. And that's very important to make it smart. Indeed. And have you got any tips on proactive messaging, Peter? Yeah, I, I think I see it used widely and proactivity can be uh, not related to the contact immediately, but kind of upstream in terms of the marketing messages and then setting expectations and then, then meeting them. So they can be incident based, but they can also be um, when you look at the customer need or the customer demands in the call center, there are lots of ways to work upstream mm -hmm. and, and try and identify what to do. I think the other thing I'm seeing something of now is some of the combinations of speech analytics, AI, and robotic process automation is, mm. um, is for example, if you're taking a simple booking in a restaurant, is the machine can be listening to what the customer is saying. It can be pre-populating the fields for the booking and allowing the agent to concentrate on actually having the conversation. And it can make knowledge-based suggestions related to the question the customer's making. So these things are getting quite sophisticated. Um, and I, I think one's got to be, um, what's the word, very alert to the number of things that we can get clever at in terms of the communication. But at the end of the day, you know, it all comes down to a, a conversation with a customer. And the co quality of the conversation is at the heart of that. So to this point that uh, Barry is making on here, Aligning the messaging or being on brand or using the style of your brand, absolutely critical to to the way in which that proactive message feels. Mm. And I think certainly uh, agree with you about the um, uh, the sort of proactive guidance. In fact, there's a, a name for that we're going to be discussing on the first uh, of our sessions tomorrow, which is the coach bot uh, uh, as a as a bot that helps coach coach staff, which I think is great. I think the other thing about proactive is also what happens next? Because all too often, if we're focused on average handling time, we just rush the caller off the off the phone rather than explaining to the caller what the company's process is. That you know, it will take five days for for this to happen. I know it's we've seemed like a long time, but you know that's how long it will be. And after five days, this will happen. And if it doesn't happen, what the next step will be? Because that's one of the problems I've often had with, with complaints saying. Well, that's fine, but what happens if after five days there is no resolution? And it's just, oh, that's fine, you just call us back. Well, if that's going to be the case, can't we deal with that now? And I think part of explaining the, the process of how your in, internal procedures is also another, another factor of, uh, of being proactive. So let's have a, have yeah, a look through. Sorry, Peter. I was just going to say, it's like tracking a parcel. So the logistics companies have got very good at letting you follow their process and see where they are in their process. And actually with a complaint or a, a, a process which doesn't involve a parcel, it's just as, um, as beneficial to a customer to know what's happening. Yeah, indeed. I had one recently with a, a, a meter uh, dispute and the process was, was 12 weeks long of uh, how long it would take to get, uh, get resolved. Uh, and in the meantime, I was being asked for a, a, a bill of £20,000 on my electricity bill that was uh, being chased up. So, again, it's nice. important to know what the, what the process is, how it's going to be resolved, rather than just don't worry about it, we'll take care of it within 12 weeks. Um, Colette says, I find sharing the data we have available with the teams helps with having the team understand why we do things. I think sometimes we get shared, scared about sharing, or if you have more transparency, it shows the bigger picture involves people into this. We have to remember our staff are the front line, and we need to understand what their what their role is. Patrice, certainly sharing data is a, 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 an awful lot easier now with our teams than it used to be. Uh, we suggest to all our customers to have wall boards everywhere, uh, and not to. Um, 
care people just to show them where they are, but also for the supervisors to know before the end of the day if someone is struggling and be able to help them. That's uh, that's key. I mean, everything is integrated, and if it's not, it should. Uh, so everybody knows where we are. Uh, we can integrate data from the contact center and data from the CRM and other data in the company, so everyone is aware where the company is going, and and um, the supervisors can know early in advance if there's an issue somewhere. Indeed, and Peter, the, the sort of the transparent company. I think it was a sort of a, a concept that was almost invented by the, the parcel tracking companies, that you know rather than hiding it, made it transparent. But there's still management is often quite opaque in a, in a large number of organizations. It can be, but I think it's changing quite a lot. I think there's, there's a technical issue here. So um, the, the CIO or the IT function used to control all the technology. That, that is breaking up because of cloud, and because of cloud, the number of APIs and the interconnections that are available has changed. What's happening now with the business information, the MI, is that um, most architectures are going to something very simple like Tableau or Click or Power BI. So all the data from all the different systems is going into, into a separate data warehouse and those very simple tools are being used which are almost user friendly. They're not quite, but you know, to somebody who can do advanced Excel, they are certainly very user friendly. There's a lot of wizards and click and place. So building dashboards has become, in the jargon, democratized it's been spread out into the business. So to Colette's point, that, that kind of technical architecture and cultural <coughs> architecture allows you to create dashboards very quickly. So you can create dashboards for audiences. So you don't have to share the, the company secrets, you can share what's relevant to somebody doing their job well. And, and that is changing rapidly because in days you can produce this stuff and it's neutral. It's not on one of the technical platforms, it's in your very simple um, MI databases. So that visualization and, and democratization is, is having some fabulous differences in some companies we're working with. Well, we've got time for a, a couple, uh, couple more tips. Um, Lucy says, we have an announcement page on our CRM system where we share hourly with the teams what service level we achieved in the last hour against our target, how many calls we took against forecast, and our AHT against forecast. This gives the agents of a view of how we're performing uh, against uh, against targets. That's uh, that's an interesting one. Is there a danger that if we're sharing AHT, there's a a, a potential Patrice that we might be hurrying, you know, sending the unconscious message that get off the the phone call and answer the next call? It depends on on the the target you give to the agent. If the if the agent doesn't have an AHT target, but the company overall has one, maybe the AHT is not good because there's not enough agents and no agent can do anything. Um, but it's it's always good to display uh, data uh, as much as you can. It can be on the on the CRM here. Uh, if your agents only have one screen, it can be good to have it on a wall board so it does not disturb the agent whilst it's uh, working with the customer. But yeah. Indeed, well, we've got, um, uh, Sharon says, we have a social forum as well as a voice forum, and we have champions of charity and uh, also of uh, SMEs. So I guess that's um, uh, that's quite a nice way of um, certainly increasing the social side and um, presumably also the networking side, Peter, which I think was a point that you made. Yeah, indeed, I think that so sociability um, it, at work is so important. Um, and in, in it, it's important to think about what can you do that makes people happier at work. Um, and some of this kind of um, social interaction around charitable causes has been very, very successful. I can remember um, Amory Stagel, you'll know well, talking about when she worked at the co-op, uh, there was a discussion at board about how come our agents can raise two million quid in 10 days because they put so much energy behind something when we find it very difficult to do X or Y or Z. And, and it goes back to people's motivation and understanding the, the causes and the, uh, the, the ambitions that people have beyond just answering the calls. And that all gives a great halo effect to the business and to the way in which people feel when they're handling the calls. Excellent. Well, we've reached the end of uh, today's webinar. So in one or two words, if you'd like to put in the uh, uh, box what you liked about today's web webinar, put that into the uh, 
into the chat room. And today's winning tip, this comes in from Michelle, who says, it's about how you deliver what you hear. We have a great things happen when you listen to initiative. So when you take the feedback and then advise what you did as a result. So for example, if you were training issues or broken processes, you advise, you said uh, this, and here, this is what we did. We had so many training sessions, we changed the process to this. So the employees know that what that what is being raised is being actioned. I think that's a great example of systemic listening to uh, staff, which I think was one of your first points there, Peter. Uh, we've got a survey if you'd like to fill that in uh, as you're leaving. You can watch the replay later on today. We're going to be back at uh, one o'clock where we're looking at the role of chatbots in the contact center, which is quite a, uh, a fascinating uh, area to look at. And uh, just like to say thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you, uh, Peter, for joining us uh, uh, during your road trip. Thank you. No, I enjoyed it. And hope the, the rest of the journey to Rome goes, uh, goes well. And uh, Patrice, th thank you for joining us from uh, Diablocom. Thank you, John T. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. And we're going to be back at uh, one o'clock where we're looking at the role of chatbots. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.